what is up? All right. <clears throat> so we're three seconds in. This is going to be exciting. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Gunner here. <laughs> uh, tonight, we're going to do a, a new segment with Fly Tire Magazine. This is going to be uh, just pretty exciting. So this is live on the vice. Hopefully, I don't mess this up because I can't go in and edit anything. But um, we're going to hang out for just like a minute or two, let some people come in because I was about two minutes late. My apologies. Uh, but I was just making sure all this works and trying to figure everything out. But um, yeah, today is going to be all about Bob Popovic's ball cap, which, oh, don't even get me started, man. It's like the greatest fly ever. Okay. And that's going to be apparent with my enthusiasm throughout this video. But um, what I want to do, because I, I jotted down some thoughts so I don't get sidetracked, because when I'm live, oh, man, I can't, you know, back out, collect my thoughts, and restart. So this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> one, why I wanted to tie a ball cap for this. So one of the questions that I get asked all the time, all the time, is where should I start? You want to get into predator time. You want to chase pike, you want to chase muskie. Maybe you've, I don't know, you live near the coast, you've never done any proper saltwater stuff, and everybody's like, where do I start with streamers? Man, the bulkhead, Popovic's work, anything with bucktail. It's just, it's it's the foundation that just, it keeps going, okay? So this is, this is, this is the gold mine right here. This is Popovic's book, Fly Design. Um, this to me is probably the greatest streamer resource as far as bucktail is concerned uh, that you're going to have available to you. And I hope after this video that you're intrigued with bucktail and you're intrigued with streamers, you're equipped. But if you want to know more, this is where you go. So we're going to, I'm going to show you Bob Popovic's bulkhead. It's obviously going to be a, a variation on it. And that's the technique that we're going to focus on. This is where I start. Bucktail, bulkheads, deceivers, hollow flies. You can tie this style of fly down to four inches, all the way up to 14 inches, 16 inches. The, the scale is endless, and bucktail is the greatest thing on the planet. So that's everything I want to say about bucktail. I also want to share uh, a handful of other influences and people to check out after this. Uh, so this, these are just a few people that I look up to uh, as far as their bucktail work, their color blending, their work with natural materials that are all kind of tied in the style that we're going to tie tonight, OK? So um, the first is Jason Taylor. Obviously, the first is Bob Popovich. Sorry, <laughs> the legend, right? OK, now the first is Jason Taylor. Um, and you can find all these guys on, on Facebook or Instagram. Sorry, guys, if you don't want me to share your stuff, but your flies are just killer. So we got Jason Taylor, uh, Johnny King, which if you don't know Johnny's kinky mother, it's like the greatest synthetic equivalent in my mind to this bulkhead pattern. Uh, you got Paul Monaghan. Um, his bucktail work is sweet. If you're just looking for bucktail inspiration, it's a great place to go. Plus, he's got tubes. Plus, he's got weedless versions. Uh, you got Jari Koski. I hope I said that right. Um, but the ties are just wicked clean, man. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. I stole your tail for this fly. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. I stole the yak blended with Flashaboo. And then at last, Rupert Harvey, whose bucktail work is sick. All of these guys tie unbelievably just unbelievable flies. Um, most are kind of in this Bob Popovic style, and it's just unreal. So last thing, I'm going to tie basically a full dressed version. And what I mean is it's going to have the bells and whistles. It's going to be counter shaded. It's going to have hackles. It's going to have some peacock. It's going to have some pheasant rump. It's going to be full dressed. But what you need to know is you can basically tie all of this with just bucktail. Just bucktail. That's all you need. And and bucktail, maybe some flashaboo. And this is a prime example of what I'm talking about. So this is just a bulkhead, it's maybe five inches, okay? And this this is like smallmouth candy. This is searching patterns for pike. You can fish this thing for, for walleye. You can fish this thing for striped bass. Like it's a perfect finger mullet. It's three-dimensionally sound. Um, this is what I fished in Brazil two years ago. And in fact, this is the fly that this is what's left of the fly that I brought back with me. <laughs> it probably has got 50 peacocks and my largest peacock. Um, and I just want to share, to me, I know I'm scatterbrained. It's really hard to do this stuff. But 
just the options, the, the amount of variability that Bucktail allows you to do. You know, um, this is what happens when you film a live video. You get scattered. I wanted to do the monologue stuff. It's hard. <laughs> um, seems to have stopped. That's an, I, I, no, we're not stopping. Uh, I hope that my internet carries me through this. I really do. So what I want to do, I'm just going to, I'm going to lose the scatterbrain. We're going to jump into the fly because it's going to save me from talking you guys to death. I'm going to get a hook and device. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this on a six out. This is a six out SL12S. It's a pretty thick gap saltwater model hook. Okay. Um, you guys can tie this on just about any predator hook. I have a handful on like six out PR320s from AREX. Uh, the 6 out and 4 out TP610. You can downscale it to about 5 inches on a, an SL12S and a 4 out. Then we have a lot of hook options available to you. Now, as that hook shank lengthens or shortens, you're just going to have more stacks or less stacks, if that makes sense. Um, and so I'm tying on a fairly short shank. You might have more steps than me if you're tying along. You might have less steps than me if you're tying along. So keep that in mind. I'm going to make sure that this video is still tracking here, and I'm going to get the camera down on the vise because I can't stop myself from being scatterbrained, and I need to. So, yes, check that sweatshirt out. 39 hours is the bomb. <clears throat> All right, let's get you guys focused in on this hook here. Then I'll turn that autofocus off so she's going good. So I had a comment about 10 minutes ago, uh, if it seems to have stopped. Let me know if this is keep going. Uh, let me know if the internet is kind of caught up with where we are. Because I got seven minutes of me just blabbering. That, I don't know. It might be good to do it over if I need to. <laughs> all right. I'm going to assume everything is all right. So, again, you can tie this on any kind of predator hook that you need to. I'm going to come in with 210. This is Flymaster Plus. Uh, Flymaster Plus is just a really nice, strong thread. It's going to allow you to lash down your bucktail work. Uh, what's also nice is it has quite a bit of build. And what you're going to see is the bulkhead technique is all about reversing the bucktail butts and integrating that into the head to create a ton of water push. Ton of water push, balance, hydraulic, all sorts of disturbance. So having a little bit of build in your thread is going to make reversing those bucktail butts super easy. If you come in with something like GSP, because it's so low build, it's really hard to build a nice thread ramp. And you're going to see when we get there exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to start my thread. You can start it quite literally anywhere. And I'm going to put down a really solid thread base. And anytime you're working with bucktail, uh, it's pretty slippery. It can be fairly slippery. And what I want you to see with this thread base, it's really, really, really rough really coarse, really thick thread. You can see all the little bumps on my screen against my black sweatshirt. Like it should be a nice coarse thread base so that as you tie that bucktail, it can't ever slip and move or do anything. Now, when you tie these flies and you say, you can tie like, you know, this little five inch version, 100% with bucktail, 100% bucktail. But my guess is most of you aren't gonna have five, six, six and a half inch bucktail, right? High quality bucktail is really, really hard to find. And so I want to show you a few variations because you can come in with things like hackles, like little slopping hackles, rooster hackles, and you can extend that length of the fly, right? You can come in and tie flashaboo versions. You can come in. This one is just thin saddles with flashaboo to get the length, right? Because if you just rely on bucktail, it's going to be hard. Now, one of the things that I've seen one of my friends post, uh, Jari Koski, is a blended yak tail. And that's what we're going to do today. And so what I have... It's just yak, and it's a big, long 12-inch hank. Now, for those of you at home who don't have yak, you can use, like, SF fiber. You can use slinky fiber. Um, you can come in and use hackles if you need to extend the length, or you can just do the flash boot version. But the, what the yak allows you to do is yak is super, super coarse, and it's really crinkly. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that yak, which is about 12 inches long, and I'm just going to blend it with some flashaboo. So I'm going to cut off a handful of flashaboo here, layer it onto my yak. I'm going to show you how to blend this once I get this up into frame here. <clears throat> so I just have some yak, 
and I just have some flash boo in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm literally just going to like pinch pull and stack this. Like I'm going to rip stack, you know, 12 inches of yak with flash boo in it. <laughs> and that's going to integrate the flash throughout the yak. And the coolest thing uh, that this that this does and accomplishes is that yak is really crinkly and coarse. And the flash boo, if you just tie in like a flash tail, all the flash can stick together and, and it can collapse. But when you integrate it with a crinkle fiber, that crinkle fiber it forces it all to be separated. It forces it all to create basically a three-dimensional shape, right? The flash can no longer just slim down into nothing. So when I go to tie this in, the, the tips of this have been tapered naturally. And I might just move this off a wee bit. So if you can see, I got, you know, that's 60% of my total length. This is 40%. I'm going to stick that 60% off the back right here. Come in, two loose thread wraps, and just shove my thumb over that. Get it all moved around nice. So it's all the way around, 360 degrees around that hook shank. You just use your fingernail pressure like this to just smash it and move it. I'm going to come and put down a thread base. And you can see that thread base, it takes up a good little bit of room right here. And the reason why is because I'm going to take that 40%, I'm going to flip that over itself on top of my thread base. And now I've created a nice little valley. Got to back my thread off there. Create a valley for my thread to lay on. So that yak is tied in twice. That yak can't ever slip. It can't ever come out. And it's just absolutely rock solid tied in there. And when you tie it in so that you have 60% going back originally and then 40% coming over, those tips all blend and taper together. Now yak, being a natural, most people are going to say you can't cut it, but you can because it's not too heavily tapered. So you can come and trim that if you need to, to get the right length. So that's how we're going to cheat the system of bucktail not being long enough. We're going to come in with this blended yak tail, yak blended with flash boot to create the length, extending back behind the fly. All that crinkle in the yak is going to keep all the flash boot separated so that the flash boot can't collapse, and it's going to build a three-dimensional tail that's fairly transparent that's reflecting light. Um, if you're going to be fishing this for toothy critters, you can come in with some super glue right here, which is going to be the case for me. So I'm going to do that or else this is going to get nasty. So what can we use to substitute the yak? Um, so I mentioned SF blend is a really easy substitute. Uh, you can use slinky fiber, which is basically unblended SF blend. Um, and what's really nice is a lot of waters, people don't always like flashy flies, right? And when you take uh, a material like this and blend it with yourself, you can make it as flashy or as unflashy as you want. Me fishing for pike and muskie, usually in unpressured water, I have you know no issues with a flashy fly or uh, a flash tail or a fly that's 100% flash boot. So I can make this pretty flashy. If you're fishing really clear conditions, high pressure systems, you can take a lot of that flash out. Um, now, you can come in with a, a ton of tail substitutes besides these kind of coarse, crinkly synthetics. So you could come in with Icelandic sheep hair. Uh, you could come in with saddle hackles and, and put down a stack of bucktail with saddle hackles, pair it all the way around them. Um, but, you know, it's just there's a lot of tails you can do. <laughs> um, and I'll give you one more option. You can do an extended body using a shank. So this is just a bucktail deceiver extended behind a bulkhead. So it's a shank, hook in the front, shank in the back, extended body to get the length instead of doing some sort of synthetic. But this keeps everything single hooked and a little bit cleaner and a little bit faster with a lot less moving parts. So it's, it's all up to you. There is no right or wrong. Uh, this is just what you guys have on hand and can do yourself at the moment. So hopefully that helps you out with a few uh, options that you can use. Now I'm going to come in with bucktail and basically Bucktail is the rest of the fly. And something that I really want to drive home is that you don't need super pristine, high quality bucktail. If you have, you know, just some four inch hair, you can create a perfect bulkhead because we cheated that tail length, right? And what you have to understand about bucktail is bucktail is a, a tapered fiber. And it's 
that is the reason why it is the king of all fibers because it's tapered. It, it literally bends progressively on your hook. So when you tie this in, these stiff butts with all this trapped air can create a lot of volume and the tips can bend and flex and move, but you never lose that inner silhouette. You never lose the core. And that's why things like hollow flies are so seductive and bulkheads swim so good because I can create all this silhouette and water push and volume, but those tips of the bucktail just breathe. Where do you get your bucktail? So I have the unfair advantage of traveling to a lot of fly shows. Um, and usually I just get them in person. I don't necessarily have a source. My source is just in person uh, because I take everything out of the package and touch it. Um, so I don't really have a, a tried and true answer for you, but something that's really important when you're looking for bucktail, a lot of people think like, I need that super long bucktail. Everybody's looking for that long bucktail, but you can cheat the system. You can do the extended body. You can use hackles. You can use yak. You can, you can make the flies longer in a lot of different ways, but Medium and short bucktail is extremely useful for creating a proper collar and a proper head. Because when I build this fly and shape this bucktail, I basically want a continuous stream of tips. Let me see if I can get a good one here. Like, look at this fly right here. You can see, I'm going to only show you the top half. From right here all the way down to the butt is nothing but bucktail tips, just completely exposed bucktail tips, 100% smooth. And the only way to create that silhouette is if you have medium hair, short hair, and shorter hair. And so that short hair becomes extremely useful for creating the actual silhouette of the fly. Everybody wants the long tail because the long tail makes for a really nice tail. And you can make a really bulky hollow fly. You can tie a super, you know, large profile beast. But in order to do a, a proper bulkhead, Having short fibers enables you to stop the tips right in this third section and create a perfectly tapered silhouette because it's the tips that are going to swim. So when I have tips from here to here all the way back, the whole fly swims. So don't focus on necessarily finding the world's greatest, longest tail. When you're tying a bulkhead, the thing that I want to look for the most, and you can see it really well in the pink, is having really wavy fibers. I like a really coarse, wavy fiber. If your fiber is really soft, it's gonna be kind of hard to control and it's not gonna have a lot of lift and volume. It's not gonna fill in the hook really well. Long soft is great for a tail, but it doesn't build necessarily a great bulkhead. So this is kind of just average bucktail, four, four and a half inches, but it's really wavy and it's really coarse. Now I need to stop talking and I need to start tying. So I'm gonna come in with a stack a bucktail and I'm going to encourage you guys more than anything to go sparse. So I cut that off the hide. I cleaned out the butts. I spun my fingers. Spinning your fingers is going to open these up so you can get all the junk out of there. And I'm going to come and I'm going to spin my thread and I spin mine clockwise so it cords up and it's really tight so it doesn't uh, I basically want to be able to put as much pressure on this as I can. Now when I hold this up here I hold these butts perfectly vertically. Now I'm going to get one super clean catch and I'm going to take the same thread path two extra times. Now the reason why you take the same thread path is because I'm going to shove my thumb right on top and it's going to move all of that hair from one spot all the way around my hook. And I can just, I, I've let go of the bobbin. Now you take your time with this. I can just pinch and pinch and pinch and pinch. I'm literally pinching right on those thread wraps. And every time you pinch those thread wraps, the bucktail just moves away from your thread pressure and I can get a perfect distribution of bucktail. Now the reason why you don't uh, have any crisscross or any angle to your thread, I took the same thread path because when you go to move that around, the bucktail follows the direction of your thread. So your thread path have to be right on top of each other perfectly straight so that when I push on that bucktail, it goes perfectly around on that same plane as my thread. You don't ever want to crisscross your thread or else it'll pull that bucktail. And that becomes really important when we do the bulkhead for being able to make it symmetrical. So I'm going to give that a straight hard pull down and I'm going to lash these butts down. And those are going absolutely nowhere. Come in here, clean that out, make sure that I don't have anything down on my bend. And you can see, so I have some yak that ends about here because the yak was tapered because I, I hand blended it so all the tips were variable. So my bucktail ends right about here. I have some tapered yak right about here and it all just bleeds right into each other to create a nice seamless tail. Now this is going to be not necessary but kind of just fun. 
This is just a really poor grade rooster saddle uh, that I found for $10 at a show. And it's got a lot of variability in it, which is very poor for dry flies, but awesome for streamers. And I'm just going to take a handful of them and I'm going to use this to counter shade the fly throughout. And I'm going to make it as long as my yak. So I just have three feathers right now. I'm going to lash these guys right on top, take my thumb, move them around here, and just have those so that they literally veil the back of the fly. And what you're going to see is we're going to do this in stages. And as we move forward, they're going to get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. And it's going to create just a a counter shaded light veil. Popovix refers to them as like a, a brush stroke with a paintbrush. You just paint the fly every time you do that. Cool. Now, this is a, a pretty big hook. It's a six out. It's pretty heavy. And I'm going to start building my bulkhead volume now. It might seem a little bit early, but uh, yeah, that's just how I'm going to, uh, I like to do this one. So I'm going to come in with pink and I'm going to kind of tie this in a hot head color combo that I, I really like when Paul Monaghan does those. They look just unbelievably good. So I've cut this off the hide, and here's the trick to the bulkhead technique, or not the trick, but actually what the bulkhead technique is. I'm going to integrate my bucktail butts into the fly itself to create bulk and volume. And the most beautiful thing about this is it creates a perfectly balanced fly. So I just spun my thread. I corded it up so it's really strong. It's not all fanned out and easy to break, but it's really strong. I'm going to take that same thread path three times, right? That way when I go to move this, it ain't tracking with my thread, but it goes all the way around. I'm going to smash that down with my thread, or sorry, with my thumb. I'm pinching right on that thread to move everything around, and I can give that a straight hard pull. And what I like to do is I just look at my butts, and I make sure that my butts have uniform density, because right now I can look right at the eye of my fly, and I can see if there's a spot that's more dense or less dense. And if you got a spot that's heavy, you just push on it and move it around. Now, you can see I'm reefing on this, and that hair's not spinning, it's not moving. I might take an extra turn or two, but there's really only four or five turns of thread on that. There's not any more than that. Tied with a boatload of pressure as cleanly as possible. Now, I'm just going to take my fingers, stroke this back, and continually work that fiber back. And I'm going to bring my thread up to my hook eye, literally just a straight line up to my hook eye in plane with my hook shank, and then draw it up in front. And what you should see is when you do that, there's no catch of material right here at the base. Absolutely no catch of material. I didn't drag anything with my thread, but I have a perfectly clean base that I can now build a ramp. So when you're building this ramp, you're not tying on the butts, you're just tying up to the butts. You're using a bunch of thread pressure to force everything backwards. And you have to be very careful that your thread path is vertical, even though you're going forwards and backwards. If you tie with your bobbin at a kind of off kilter, you're gonna build a cone of thread that is not symmetrical. And it's gonna be very obvious because your hair is not gonna be symmetrical. And if your hair throughout the fly is not symmetrical, she ain't going to track straight and she ain't going to swim true. So you need to build a perfect thread cone that's all the way perfect, you know, it's vertical, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, it's always vertical. Now I'm going to leave this right here. I'm going to hold down my long fibers and I just feather the edges of this bucktail all the way around. And it's because we're doing multiple, multiple stacks. I just want all this to bleed into each other. If you can leave them straight if you want, but it creates kind of like a little stair step in the fly and it's not all necessary. So that's our first true bulkhead tie. Super clean, uh, pretty fairly straightforward. I'm gonna refocus this just because I, I bumped my vise and it's on a pedestal at the moment. Now you can come in, I'm gonna come in and just put some copper flash down the back so that the, the fly is countershaded along with the hackles here. And you can use, you know, flash bool or polar flash or wing and flash or whatever flash you like. This is holographic copper right here. And I like to, I'll literally draw my, my flash around my thread, pin it right to the top, and you can see my back one and my forward one separated, and it allows me to pull them to 
opposite sides and I basically have my uh, flash going as a V over the back of that fly so that I can get a really nice clean transition and make sure it's not moving all over the place. <clears throat> Sweet, we're gonna come in and do another pink one. What thread are you using? So this is 210 Flymaster Plus. Uh, and again, because I built that thread band to reverse that bucktail, having a thread with some build, and this is wax, so it's pretty grippy, I can create a really nice tight thread comb that's gonna build quickly and reverse all this bucktail. If you come in with you know, something for hair work, like GSP, it's such low build that you're going to have a really hard time building this cone and reversing this hair. You're going to be able to cinch it down and lock it in place, but you're not going to be able to control it very easily. And then when you come in and you do your feather work and you do your flashy boot work and you do all the head details, GSP is way too slippery to control all that. I mean, some of you might be able to do it, but it's really tricky. Having a nice, thick, corded, round thread with some wax on it, which is the Flymaster Plus, uh, perfect grip, a lot of control, easy build, but it's not like unruly, right? Just when we do the head, it's not like the thread gets away from you and you crowd your hook eye. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm using and why. I'm going to come in with another stack of pink. Again, I'm going to grab these by the butts. I'm going to spin my fingers to open up the butts, clean out all that garbage. And again, we're going to leave the butts in the fly. I'm going to spin my thread so it's nice and corded. I'm going to leave these butts. I'm going to take just a sliver off just to get some taper between my stacks here. I'm going to do the same thread path three times, perfectly vertical thread path so that my bucktail tracks over that thread as I manipulate it. And I'm just going to pinch and pinch and pinch. And I'm pinching as hard as I can right on that thread. And you can even let go. Like the, the bobbin pressure isn't super important. You have all the time in the world to make this fly as good as you can possibly can. There's there's no hurry here. Now if you can come in and start to spin that, get to your hook eye and support your hook eye, you'll have a perfect flare spun bucktail 360 degrees, perfectly uniform. Look at the hook eye, check the density of the bucktail and it'll be as clean as possible. Watch many pike fly hunting videos in years. Thanks Dustin. I really appreciate that. I'm, I apologize to everybody who's been with me from the beginning because the first 10 minutes of this video, I was completely scatterbrained. I'm truly sorry. <laughs> I haven't, I'm, I'm going to monologue over this. I have not tied flies in about three weeks because uh, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate right now that my wife is able to work from home, but uh, I let her use my office. So she's using my office for her workspace and I've kind of been kicked out of my fly tying realm and man, I was just scatterbrained sitting down trying to do a live feed. It's, it's kind of weird because I'm literally talking to myself and trying to make coherent sentences. <laughs> it's, it's unusual, but uh, I, I really appreciate that, Dustin. So I reversed all that bucktail, just the butts. Uh, make sure that that thread path when you're building that cone is, is nice and vertical so that you build a symmetrical cone. And I'm going to come and feather this. Feather, feather, feather. And I'm holding down. I'll literally come in and hold down my wing materials so that I don't clip any of my long fibers. And this is, a, I would call it off the cuff. When you do this trimming, it's hard because it's not accurate and what's more difficult to teach is it's intentionally not accurate i mean you have to be intentional about not being accurate it's such a weird thing to to try to trim and shape a perfectly round head like that uh, but you just kind of get used to it i guess <laughs> it's one of those things i don't know how else to explain it um, i'm going to come in with a handful more flash here This is Predator Flash, so if you see me manipulating this, it's because it's a really long fiber shank. Uh, and it's, it's really nice to have that long material anytime you're blending it with those synthetics like Slinky or, or with the Yak, obviously, which is not synthetic. But it's a really long cut fiber, so I can use those fibers at full length. So I'm going to, again, top dress that, counter shade that with Copper Flash. I'm going to come in here, pull out a handful more hackles. Now, these hackles... As you do these kind of 
Popovic style paintbrush strokes with these hackles. And again, you could dress the bottom. You could dress the bottom with, you know, yellows and whites and pinks. Um, but I'm just going to do the back on this one. But they're going to get shorter. They're going to be progressively tapered so that everything in the fly is tapered. Everything from start to finish is tapered. So I'm going to make sure the tips are just a bit uneven. And I'm going to make sure that this stack is about an inch and a half, two inches shorter than my previous stack. Just get kind of a messy tie right on top. Thumb pressure is going to move those all the way around. And you'll see when I flip this up that you're going to have just a nice kind of counter shaded fly just using, honestly, junk saddle that I found at a show for $10. Just junk saddle. And it makes a perfect kind of wing on a streamer for just counter shading and realism and all that finesse detail. Surprised I haven't got a comment about, you know, water weight or castability. We'll get there at the end. I hope you guys save some comments for the end because I can't stop myself from talking. Is that pink squirrel? This is a pink bucktail. So we're working with, you know, four or five inch pink bucktail at the moment. Hey Hans, uh, this is 210 Flymaster Plus. So that's what I'm using. You can use, uh, you know, flat wax nylon. You can use any sort of round grippy thread. You can use GSP, but if you watch back in the video, I don't recommend it for a handful of reasons, mostly just detailed work and being able to control the bucktail. But uh, yeah, hope that helps you out. 210 Flymaster. Um, I'm going to finish this with a hothead because uh, Paul Monaghan ties these sick, like white, yellow, orange flies and they just destroy his European pikes, and I'm going to steal your color combo. <laughs> I threw the pink in because I got tannic water, and I really like the pink and the tannic. But we're going to finish this with some orange here. Now, as I move forward in this fly, I want that bucktail to be just a little bit shorter. Now, naturally, I kind of selected an orange tail that was already shorter than the pink tail, but you can come and you can just take the longest fibers out. What you don't want to do is you don't want to take a long fiber, say you have a nice tail that's like five inches and you want to create taper, you don't want to cut that long tail down to four inches or three and a half inches. Because I mentioned earlier that bucktail is progressively tapered. So thick butt, thin tip, so when it swims, it swims like this and you get all this bulk. Well, if you take a long fiber and you cut it halfway short, you lost all of the volume. You lose all the bulk giver. And so what you end up with is just thin fibers that you can't really control. They don't add any volume to the fly, and they don't swim because they don't have the progressive taper. In order to make the whole fly swim from top to bottom and get that just sexy serpentine action that a pop of big fly has, you have to use the long fibers when you need long and the short fibers when you need short so that you maintain the complete progressive taper of the material to maximize the action. I know that was long-winded. I'm sorry, but it's kind of a big deal especially when people kind of they don't like short bucktail but short bucktail is extremely important so this is shorter i took some of the long fibers out so that i'm not trimming it i'm going to spin my thread and we're going to fit two more stacks right here in this space and that's another reason why the 210 is useful because I, I have a lot more control of where this goes and the fact that it stays there so that thread path is right on top of itself that way this bucktail, when I spin this, it tracks right on top of itself. I don't accidentally crowd that hook eye. Pinch, pinch, pinch so that I get a nice uniform distribution. I'm gonna pull that down. And when I'm checking the density of these butts, I have a little bit more material on the bottom. That's totally okay. I've relaxed my bobbin. I pinched the bottom. I'm gonna pinch the sides. I'm gonna reflare it. Now I'm gonna check again. And they're like, that's good. So I only have like three turns of thread on this, but it's it's okay because I'm gonna like, look, it's not going anywhere. That 210 is important. This is a six op that I'm deflecting in my vise with my thread. And I'm going to take, you know, just an extra security blanket of two turns, work that back, work that back, and work that back. And this thread right here is going to come straight up to my hook eye in plane with my hook shank and then in front. And when I flip that over, there should be no trap fibers. No trap fibers. And it's extremely important because if you trap fibers, the front right here of this bucktail, there won't be a clean line. It won't, all, the, all of my thread that I, that I lashed that down with, same place, same place, same place. So when I flip it over, I have a perfectly clean line of bucktail right here to make and push my cone against so that I have a perfectly clean cone 
with vertical thread so that I have a perfectly round head on this fly. Everything's about getting that perfectly round symmetrical fly. Now, um, I, want, I just want to mention this. As I went back into this cone, this is something that a lot of people struggle with, is shaping this cone. When you go back into this fly, if you come up onto your cone, way up here, and now my thread's touching the bucktail, and then you, fl if, if you pull down, you're going to reflare it, and you're going to ruin all the shape you created. So I want to I wanna highlight this real quick, because if I don't do it now, the tutorial's going to be over, and it'll never be set. <laughs> so when I'm building this cone, you're going to see me control my thread pressure by drawing out thread, because this, this is a, a right bobbin, so it has tension on it, right? And if you have a spring bobbin, the spring ears have tension on your spool. And if I want to tie with less tension than my bobbin, I have to physically draw out thread so that as I tie, my bobbin nose is going to get closer and closer and closer to my hook because I'm not drawing out thread as I'm tying. I'm, I'm tying at less pressure than my bobbin set to. That low pressure wrap against that bucktail allows me to control the angle without reflaring it. That's super critical. So I can pull down here, my thread's in front of my ramp. I can pull down as hard as I want here, relax some thread, come up, control that cone, and then come back down. Now I've created a perfectly shaped and angled head without reflaring it and having to start all over and getting frustrated at being able to control the angle. It's something that a lot of people struggle with. You have to be able to draw out and intentionally tie it with less pressure than the spring tension of your bobbin to control the bucktail. So I'm going to come <clears throat> feather this. Ben, I appreciate you saying good job, but man, you should have been here for the start because it was a bumpy start, man. <laughs> uh, I got very scatterbrained. I'm a little bit embarrassed. Now that I'm, I'm kind of in the groove, things seem to be going pretty well. But All right. That man, that man, I love bucktail. Bucktail's the greatest thing ever. So I'm going to throw a little half hitch right here. One of the beautiful things, if you guys are tying on different hook models, which I would suspect nearly everybody's tying on probably a different hook model, um, one of the nice things about tying these on saltwater hooks is I got a beefy eye because I'm going to do one more bulkhead stack right here. Now, a lot of people might just fill this up with thread, but this is these bulkhead ties, you can tie these suckers clean, man. You can get a clean head on these suckers because I got a nice thick hook eye that I can build the thread pressure of my cone against, against the hook eye. So you don't need a lot of shank length to actually build that up. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to start working my way down this tail. I should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about bucktail, but a lot of times those long fibers, so we're talking about creating taper, how important short fibers are. The long fibers tend to be up in this sweet spot this third mark up here between the tip, which on this one's broken off, the tip's broken off. Uh, but this section right here is the sweet spot. As you get lower, closer to where it attaches to the deer, literally where the tail attaches, a lot of times you get some super short fibers that make a perfect head and collar. This is the money zone on a bulkhead. This might be the money zone on a hollow fly or deceiver, but on a bulkhead, man, this is like, the, you can see how used it is because it's cherished. And this side is completely gone. So I'm going to come and find some of those short, coarse, nasty fibers that people don't like. And I'm going to make a nice, beautiful head on this thing. Come here, where you at? <clears throat> now I want to show you guys a trick here. So when I cut this off the hide, I don't know if you can see the, the different tones in my bucktail. But this is from, part of this is from the back side of this tail, right? So it's nice and dark but I have that light belly. Now, if you spin this, you're literally gonna get like dark in one spot, light in the other. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna clean out the crap first, sorry. And then I'm literally gonna pinch this with my thumb and my hand, and I'm gonna hand blend this so that all of that variation in color gets moved throughout the material. And this is how you blend multiple colors of bucktail together. You just grab them by the tips and rip stack them into your hand and you can create, you know, chartreuse and plink pink blends instead of doing two tie-in zones you just do a single one that's all stacked and then if you flip it over you don't need a hair packer you can just drop her into your hand you got to make sure that your the hand that's working the bucktails not you know tacky or sweaty which if you got a bunch of lights on you it's a little bit sweaty but it works and look i got a nice clean butt almost like i cut it off the hide 
but I perfectly blended all that color so it's not in one spot, evened everything back up, and that's how you would get a color blend if you ever wanted to do that. So I'm going to spin my thread again right here at the end. I want to put a lot of pressure and I want it to be really clean. I'm going to hold this up here. I'm going to catch that, and I'm going to take that same thread path. So that that bucktail follows that thread path. I'm going to shove my thumb on it. And this, as you get closer to that deer, the deer's butt where it attaches, it's going to start behaving a little bit more like deer hair. So you can see I got quite a bit of flare and life out of that. And I'm going to pack this back against my eye. I'm going to bring that thread right up through. Now I suspect it's hard to tie like that in that clean manner. And I want to throw a half inch in here and just reef on this for a sec. That hair only has like four turns of thread on it, right? Like it only has, it ain't going anywhere. Like you're not going to pull it out. <laughs> if you take four proper turns with 210, it shouldn't go anywhere ever for any reason whatsoever. Um, so I just, I wanted to reef on that real quick and kind of make that point. The less turns you take, the less mistakes you're going to make, the more even all those are going to be, the more even you're going to be able to reverse that and get a perfectly clean bulkhead. Now I'm going to use that hook eye to force all that back. And again, I'm going to draw out thread so I can tie with less pressure up against that bucktail to create the shape head that I want. My, my wife is putting my kid to bed and she's is, uh, we call it a zerber. I don't know what you guys call it. Like when you use your mouth to fart on, you know, bare skin. <laughs> she's zerberting his belly. He's just laughing. Sorry, I can't help it. She's being a rock star and putting that kid to bed all by herself so that I can do this. But I just methodically go around. And again, you got to put yourself into like some weird Zen mode where you intentionally make a. I don't know, a not clean fly that is in fact clean because it's not clean. I don't know how to describe feathering a bulkhead like that, but it's like this weird, you just, it's, you have to intentionally do it weird. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's such a weird thing to trim bucktail like that. But that's basically a fishable fly right there. And we're going to come in and just clean it up and make it look super super sexy so i'm going to come in handful more hackles i'm going to find some short ones again these have all been staggered so that the tips aren't even all the hackle tips are a little bit different length and all the final lengths of the hackles where they lay is all long medium short so they all bleed into each other and i'm going to wing these right over the back to help counter shade the fly I'm just going to put them all in with one thread turn, kind of move them around. This would be a cool place to put like white on the belly for a little throat patch or something like that. But I'm just going to keep it simple and counter shade it and then get a nice clean scissor cut right there. Now I'm going to come in and I saw this tented pheasant rump head that Jason Taylor did. And then ever since then, I've seen Chocolate doing these full dress game changers that are just unbelievably sexy. And they're all using pheasant rump tented over things. And I'll share this with you guys. This is a, a hen pheasant rump hackle that I put eyes on. I literally used a flexible UV resin to adhere an eye to a hackle so that it maintains the shape of my bulkhead. I don't lose any of the volume, but I have a proper eye spot for like a sucker or some sort of chub imitation. And that is what I would demonstrate for you guys, but I came up with that this winter and I haven't, you have the time to properly test it. So I'm gonna come in with pheasant rump. This is dyed yellow. And this is the feather that I would use to do those eyes. If you ever wanna try it, you just use flexible resin and put those suckers on. But I'm gonna come back into this little fat stem section because I'll be able to control the angle of my feather really cleanly. And the reason I should articulate this, I suppose, the reason why I'm using rump feathers from a pheasant is because all these stems down here, they're flattened on the same plane that the feather is. So if I tie this uh, at an angle, it'll stay at that angle. If I tie it on the side, it'll go on the side. If I tie it on top, it'll go on top. The feather's never going to roll on you. That's one of the reasons why you're going to want to use this style feather. And I've come in and I've taken that feather stem and I've just reinforced the fact that it's flattened in that orientation with my scissors. I'm literally pinching the stem between the flat blades of my scissors. 
Now I'm going to come and I'm just going to dress this up here at an angle and kind of tent the head. Now, the reason why I'm doing it without eyes still is because I think it creates like a really cool counter shaded skull to this bait fish imitation because fish heads are always darker and we blended all of our bucktail just 360. And this adds a lot of texture, tone, dark spots right up here at the head and it counter shades the head. And those feathers are just tied in as a V over the back. And the reason why I left some room in there is if I can find it, I'm gonna come in with some peacock curl as my final, my final little touch on the top and make it look pretty. And I'm gonna take some really long peacock Boy, that might have been a little bit much. This is a true wing. This is probably, you know, like 20 strands. It's not a light amount. And I might take this and I might make the tips some very, I'm going to put a little finger taper into the tips so they're not all the same length. And I'm just going to do a nice clean stack right down the back of that fly, ending maybe about a little past halfway. Get a perfectly clean cut on this. Get a nice clean thread path right down over my hook eye. And I'll take my thumb, just like with the bucktail, just like with the flash, and I'll put just a little veil into that so that it's not all corded up in one spot. And then you can control that against the bucktail, cinch it down right over the hook eye. Come up here, we'll throw a half hitch and a whip on there. Now this looks a little unruly right now, and y'all gotta believe me just for one second while I put some super glue on here. And I'm gonna I always tie with white thread. I only tie with white thread. It saves you some money, but I'm gonna hit that with a marker. So it looks pretty. I'm gonna hit this with some super glue to protect that thread, seal all that in, keep my knot secure. Not gonna lie, I trapped a little bit of fibers here on the underside with my bucktail. So you can take a bodkin while that glue's drying, clean up that hook eye, make sure you don't have any pheasant trapped in that hook eye. You should have a nice open hook eye that I can fit, you know, some 40 pound monofilament through or some bite wire or a bite trace like that. Now, all of this peacock, I don't really want it to stand up like that in the water. That doesn't look very good. And what you can do is you can compromise your material to get it to lay correctly and swim truer. And so just like when you curl a ribbon, you literally take your scissor blades, run them under the underside, you create a bunch of micro tears and fractures and it creates less stiffness. You have a stiffer back and a limper belly and it creates curve. Now I can take these peacock hackles and draw them up just like a ribbon. And you wanna be delicate and you are intentionally compromising the integrity of the feather to get a, a truer swim out of it so that it veils the back of your fly. Oh yeah. And that is a fully dressed Bob Popovic's bulkhead with tented pheasant rump eyes, 360 degree flash tail, three dimensional bulk thingamabobber. <laughs> Let me get this thing out of my vise here, show you guys what we're working with. So I'll back this out. I'll try to get this focused near my hand. Uh, if I hold this up right here. All right, and then let me zoom down. So that's the finished fly. Um, yeah, counter shaded, lightly dressed with hackles down the back. You could counter shave that with material like uh, the yak or some more flashy boo, but the feathers, the feathers are just like paint strokes. You can just touch them up, a little brown on the back, a little pink on the belly, a little yellow on the throat. You just, and you want to use super thin hackle, super thin, like, because the thinner it is, the less water weight you get. You don't want to use a big, thick, webby hackle. Now, that being said, I will use thick, webby hackles to create like tails. Well, again, we talked about tail variations. This using the yak blended with flashaboo. This one's using hackles. You can use hackles to create a nice dimensional tail. The webbier, the more volume you get, the more bulk it appears to have. Um, that has soft hackle peck fins on it, right? So you can use stuff like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to 
hang dry this. So this is something that's important. I mentioned this in like every bucktail tutorial I do, but I've never showed anybody. Um, so I'll just show you now. But I have my mechanical room is right over here. And so I'm literally going to disappear for a second. I'm going to go run this under my mechanical room sink and get it soaking, drenching wet. And then I'll just hang it so that it's head up, tail down in the vise. Because all this bucktail right now and all this flash and the feathers and everything, it has a little bit of static. It's, it's just all fighting each other. Some of the bucktail maybe has a little bit of a, like a cowlick to it or it has a little bit of curve to it. And when you get it wet, <coughs> here's my finished one. It'll all streamline down into this perfect teardrop, which is how it actually swims and fishes and looks in the water. That perfect little silhouette taper teardrop, it's, it's the same. These are the same flops, I promise you. But all these straight edges are simply because it hasn't been wet and hung dry. So I'm going to get this wet, let it hang dry. If you have any questions, feel free to, to type them in, rifle them off. I know this has been a long video. Uh, but I'll do whatever I can to, to make sure that everything's answered. And again, I apologize for the slow, long-winded, scatterbrained start. But I'll be right back. Man, she's soaking wet. And I'm gonna I'll make sure if I have good lighting, I'll take a picture of it tomorrow. Am I doing that the right way? Yeah. Funny story, this is the only thing I usually use a whip finisher for. <laughs> I just I take my whip finisher and hook it through the hook eye and hang dry all my flies on it. But let me put this up here on my face. And I'll try to make sure that that's focused on me so that we don't have like any weird non-focus stuff. Scott. Hey, Scott, how's it going? What bait fish does it represent? So to me, I tend to br break bait fish down into categories based on silhouette. Uh, and it's just an oversimplification. So to me, there's like two styles that are very prevalent. There's a third one that's kind of in between, but you have fish that are high and tight, so big, wide profile fish that are really narrow in body and head. A really good example is like a herring, right? Uh, they tend to be very laterally compressed, very wide. A good freshwater example would be like a bluegill. Very easy to picture how thin they are, but how tall they are. This tied bulkhead style 360 degrees is more like a sucker imitation, very broad head, wide pectoral fins, very tubular rounded body that's 360 degrees all the way, snout to tail. Uh, your chubs look like that. If you tie this downsized, uh, where's that one that I had? I forget, multiple, I, don't, I got flies all over the place. I showed a little five inch white one. Right, that's a proper sculpin silhouette, having a head profile just like that. You could tie literally a bucktail single hook sculpin fly using the bulkhead technique. Um, <clears throat> so aside from suckers and chubs, a lot of times this is just an easy way to create lift in a fly. So when you have, because we could go back to the bluegill imitation. So when I tied this, everything I tied was in the round. What I mean, it was 360 degrees. So when I tied this in, it had vertical, thread wraps, I shoved my thumb into it, I tried to get symmetry. Now, I did that to get a round head, but I don't have to have a round head. So there's a lot of fish. <clears throat> a good example would be like a bunker, not a bunker, a mullet. A mullet, they have this kind of like triangular head-shaped snout that's kind of like wide and ovule with their eyes on top. That's what Popovics originally designed the fly to imitate. And if you look at this fly, it's very, uh, let's see if I can get this camera focused down here. It's really wide, so it's wide, about two inches wide, very abrupt snout, but it's very flattened. So when I tied this bucktail in, I actually tied it in, and then I pinched it top and bottom. So all of my uh, bucktail went out to the sides. And then I tied it in with thread pressure, so I have more bucktail on the sides and less on top and bottom to alter the silhouette of the fly. So you don't have to tie it in the round. Because when I gave the bluegill example, 
you can tie a bulkhead bluegill. When you tie the bucktail and you pinch it, pull it straight down, you get the hair top and bottom, and I am still able to integrate bulk forward, density forward, uh, buoyancy forward to create balance, because a lot of times when you tie baitfish imitations, you strip them and they dip head down. Bulkheads don't do that because they have all of this water resistance and buoyancy from the bucktail butts that the fly literally strips, suspends, oftentimes glides off to the side, full profile show, especially you have a nice thick hook on there. It goes, <clears throat> boom, they come and just hammer the crap out of that thing, right? So I tied this, I tied this in the round, broadhead. I'm in Minnesota. I'm fishing pike and muskie, usually, which are eating suckers and chumps, soft raid fish, soft fin, fin, soft raid finned fish. <laughs> but you can use the technique in any sort of orientation and displacement that you want. Uh, Popovic's original pattern is designed to imitate a finger mold. So I think that is answering your question, Scott. Yeah, Chris, Chris says I can verify, verify this slice action in the water with Gunner on the rod. I got Chris, thank you for having me down to Texas. Uh, I, I went down to the Houston Fly Fishers Dr. Ed Rizzolo tying festival this fall. Um, and we got to go fishing and I fished a bulkhead. And it was one of the coolest things. I've never fished a bulkhead on a floating line. So they are semi buoyant. It depends on how thick your bulkhead work is. Uh, so you can obviously tie them fairly sparse and they'll break the surface depending on your hook weight. But I only brought a floating line and I fished a bulkhead, like a four inch one on a floating line. The coolest thing was we had, we had like shallow water cove and I'm casting out and it would just sit one inch below the water and it would never get any lower. It would just like sit perfectly in the film and I could wait for a bass to cruise and strip, strip, strip. And so I wasn't ever disturbing them with my cast. Now, in all fairness, we had really tough weather conditions and I didn't catch anything, but it was really sexy to see that fly just hover one inch under the water, perfectly suspended, and then swim when you strip it, and it would literally go boom, 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 and just profile show. It was sick. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> when you're working on this fly. Um, so the, the question from Mark Ryan, when you are working this fly, are you using strip length and speed for the action? or do you ever use the rod tip to control the action? So the biggest issue that you're gonna have using the rod tip to control this fly is this fly is too big. So it's gonna to have too much water resistance and when you go to manipulate it with your rod tip, it's gonna overload your rod tip and you're not gonna get the snap. So a lot of times you're fishing a, a fast action rod or an ultra fast action rod, it's got a really quick tip. And the cool thing about that is if you do like a jerk strip, a Kelly Gallup jerk strip, that tip is going to load and unload, and it's going to flick that fly forward. So that's and you can put all this little manipulation in. But this has too much water resistance. If you do that, you're not going to get any sort of nuanced response. So this is a straight hard strip fly. A lot of times you'll see saltwater guys fish it two hand retrieve. The water pressure because it's bulky and throwing water because the head can't collapse with all those bucktail butts on there, the fly will just swim if you just pull it through the water. And one of the things that I like to do is I'll, you can two hand, you know, strip, 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 pause, and you're going to get swim, 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 profile show. Or you can just do strip, 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 strip. I almost always use a straight hard strip and you can accelerate the strip if you want to get that kind of pressure release to get that action of the, the momentum and the carry but you won't be able to use the rod tip to control the fly in this size range. Thanks, Hans. I really pre appreciate you sticking through. I know you jumped on Bramer's Custom Flies page before this, man. I, I appreciate you watching. Thanks for the kind words, man. Thanks, Scott. For Shad, what is your recommendation? Uh, as a shad imitation, um, and it would definitely depend on size range uh, for shad, what is your recommendation? So like if you wanted to imitate like a juvenile shad, I have a pattern called the Jerk Junior that I freaking love, and that thing makes like a perfect little three inch shad imitation. Um, if you need to imitate like a big old bull shad at like 12 inches, you can tie like a, a Sedoti Slammer. You could literally tie like a mature 
12 inch shad, no problem. This uses 100% yak, which is the tail of this slide blended with flashy boot. And that's Mark Sidoti's slammer. This is the yak head version. You could tie like a beast fly. And if you have the proper hook to keel it, you can displace all that bucktail as a hollow fly, more so high and tight to create that shad silhouette. And tying it in a hollow fly extended body beast would allow you to tie it in seven inches, six inches, all the way up to 12 inches, all the way up to 14 inches. You could tie whatever size shad you have. And so you could go from like bucktail receiver to hollow fly to extended body hollow fly, and you could imitate shad for the whole length. So I hope that helps you out. What's going on here, Abe? <laughs> I'm just taking your patterns and, I don't know, sharing them. <laughs> Bob, if you watched the beginning, I hope you don't watch the beginning. I had way too long-winded of a rant that was so scatterbrained. I just hope everybody knows that this is your fly and that it's absolutely ingenious. <laughs> oh, Chris, have I ever weighted this pattern? So I... 95% of the time, I don't really weight my flies. Um, I So you have to understand is how I came into the sport because I did not come in from a dry fly nymphing floating line perspective. I was a gear fisherman. I love jig fishing and ripping jerk baits. I was like 14. My dad's like, here, read Kelly Gallup streamers on steroids. Uh, whoops, that sent me down the rabbit hole, right? So I was like a 15 year old with a six weight and 200 grain full sinking line with a weightless fly mentality. And I still carry that. I will weight balance my flies. I might weight flies for casting. I think it's extremely important to have flies for different water columns and different scenarios. And so I have lightweight patterns and heavyweight patterns. But when I tie a bulkhead, I have a specific scenario in mind. And that my favorite thing about the pattern is that it's unweighted and that it balances. That's my favorite thing. Because so many patterns strip and dip. And to have a fly that strips and suspends, strips and suspends and just glides and shows its profile and hovers, it's so cool to have that counterpart because almost every other fly strips and dips. Almost every other fly doesn't have the balance that this fly has because of all the bulk and all the bucktail right at the head over the entire mass of that hook. And so... I don't weight this fly because to me, this is the counterpart to every other fly that does dip, that does jig, that does have some weight. This is the unweighted that just rules all other unweighted flies. So I think that's what I mean by that, Chris. Whew, man, these are a lot of comments. <laughs> uh, Chris, man, don't. Don't brag, okay? This Saturday's trout opener, it was 18 degrees this morning, and my river that was more or less thawed refroze over with skim ice. So it's not looking too good. <sighs> Popovics, man, I could just talk and talk. It's a, it's a problem. It's not a good thing. It's a problem. I watched your composite. Hang on. Oh, is it Hal? Hal Martin? Hang on a sec. I gotta, would you recommend any other materials that would create a, an effect similar to a feathered game changer? Kind of hard to run Marabou or W. It is pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, the, I don't know if I, so when I did my brushes, to me that was like a phase in my time. And what I mean by that is like, I, if you if you watch my YouTube channel, everything's kind of gone in phases. And when I did dubbing brushes, I did dubbing brushes for like a year and a half, and it was the like only thing I did. <laughs> and I ended with a composite bugger brush, and I haven't really gone back. Um, so Hal, I, I don't really have a, a good suggestion for you. Um, that composite bugger brush was pretty cool to me. The thing that I'm currently just in love with is pheasant rump, um, and pheasant rump is an amazing kind of soft tackle feather, beautiful taper modeling. You can veil it, you can veil it over like a chocolate's translucency brush. Um, it's really easy to use, available, long enough shank, uh, shaft length, the, fi the fibers are really long, but uh, I, don't, I don't really have a suggestion for you there, Hal. Sorry about that. Basically what I mean is I just went through a phase and that phase kind of ended and I never pursued it any further. 
because I started tying with naturals, uh, mainly bucktail and feathers, thanks to Popovics. This is more or less your fault in a good way. Um, but that's that kick has continued with me. And the reason why is because naturals are never the same. I mean, I tied with three different bucktails tonight, and each each bucktail has different characteristics, length, curviness, waviness, trapped air, you know, the sweet spots are different longer. They, they just behave a little bit different. And every time you tie with that natural, you kind of have to tie in the moment. You always have to be on your A game. And it's it's kind of really addicting to tie with bucktail and hackles and get the right shape and the silhouette every single time because the material changes every single time. So it's a really fun challenge. So that's kind of why I, I moved away from brushes, not because they're not effective or they're not fun or that and possibilities are endless, but I just I kind of found a different challenge that I, I can't seem to break out of to go back. So, yeah, so Seth, um, it should be saved to Fly Tire Magazine's Facebook page. When I end this video, you'll be able to go back and watch the whole thing as if it's a YouTube video. Uh, but that page is going to upload and it's going to get shifted down and down and down and down. So if you want to be able to reference this later, and please skip the intro because I was so scatterbrained, just skip it. Uh, but just cop when this is over, go to the Facebook page and copy and paste that link and link to the, the video and email it to yourself or something so that you can find it as that Facebook, uh, as the Fly Tire Magazine page continues to update. So everyone will be able to go back and watch the full video. Yeah, bucktail and marabou are literally just everything, <laughs> everything. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate all the question, the Q&A stuff at the end. Um, I really appreciate everybody who watched the whole thing. That's crazy. It's been an hour and seven minutes, you guys. Um, I hope this is helpful. I hope the demo was everything you needed with nothing missing. I know I talk a lot. I know my videos are long. I know I'm long-winded. But the idea is to help you tie the best fly you can. If you don't like the talking, I'm sorry, but for the greater good, put up with it. Fast forward if you need to, but <laughs> it is what it is. So thanks for watching. Take care. If you want to see the video again, save the link. And for everybody who's at home, stay healthy. And if you are fortunate enough to get out, go stick a fish. See ya.